idea of this turbulence in the quantum world is not so hard. Right? So it's a vision, right? How the things evolve, uh, Magunsa in different places, <laughs> right, city? Frevo, I think turbulence has a, no, Frevo is very organized, right? <clears throat> OK, this is more like Samba going after a trio electric one, right? It's turbulent. Now uh, I want to go back to equilibrium. This, everything I told you is out of equilibrium. You know, the, the drop of superfluid does not want to be there that way. I force it to be. It's brutal. It's out of equilibrium. OK? Now I want to go back to equilibrium. Suppose I have a condensate, and I is in equilibrium. I want to do thermodynamics, and uh, this is a condensate. And you know thermodynamics. What is thermodynamics? Entropy, heat capacity, compressibility. Tell me something more. Heat capacity, entropy. Huh? Partition function? Uh, yeah, uh, one more. Huh? Internal energy. Huh? Pressure. Volume. What else? <laughs> hey, come on, guys. Uh, you want all partition function? <laughs> Maxwell relations. Good. Normally, if you have a system with a variable density, this is what we call a non-homogeneous system, all right? It's hard to do the thermodynamics uh, because you have to maybe uh, think that each portion is independent. And in condensates, it's not true. You know, I start by saying that the wave function of each atom is the whole condensate. How can I say that locally things are different? All our thermodynamics is based on some homogeneity. Or assuming that each part is a tiny homogeneous system. When I assume that, we call local density approximation. We apply this for atoms, for crystals, for anything. What is local density approximation? Well, I'm starting by considering density that varies. It's not constant in space. And the system has some energy as a function of position, right? An example of this is a gas in the gravitational field. I think everybody in this room already made a derivation of the uh, barometric uh, expression for the density in the gravitational field, right? You obtain that the density or the pressure goes with exponential of minus mgz divided by kt. Remember this? It's an example of local density approximation. You imagine that each layer is in equilibrium in some energy, and you do the derivation. OK? So normally, I have this. And the way to do the local density approximation, oh, this is also used for solid state, right? People do a lot of this. I want to, I want to eliminate, because uh, for me, it's no good the position. So I express density in terms of energy. If I express density in terms of energy, the pressure in each point is how many particles can have energy bigger than the one I have here. It's like uh, in the gravitational field. You say that the pressure here depends on the column above. Right? You remember this? OK. And then when I do that, I solve any problem because I make an approximation and I go for it. This is called local density approximation. And the thermodynamics of non-homogeneous system is done by that way. I did an example here. Suppose I have a harmonic trap, which is basically what we have all the time. The density goes like exponential. It's Gaussian, right? You all know that? And the density as a function of energy is this. So suppose I have a classical gas. Instead of being in a container with walls, it is in a harmonic trap. There is no really walls. 
Particles with more energy can go further. Particles with less energy stay close to the bottom. Right? <laughs> this is what makes this density. But uh, I just made a calculation here very fast to show to you that P equal NKT, which is the ideal gas law. Right? Could put N here. Oh, this is small n is uh, the integration here. So is the number of uh, moles or, or in fact, here is related to density. Uh, the, the, here is N is 0, the local one. And this obey the classical law. When I have a condensate, this is not true. When I have a condensate, I have a profile of density. And uh, many people up to now do local density approximation. And, you know, even science paper they publish doing local density approximation. Something happens. Oh, in return. And uh, one of the things we are very interested in is compressibility. Compressibility is one of those susceptibilities that shows a lot about phase transition. OK? And um, what, uh, what people do is they say, in a condensate, I have a profile of density. And I, I can show very easy to you. I, I think I did it here, maybe here to show that the compressibility, which is normally the variation of volume with pressure, it became variation of density with energy. Of course, is my assumption from the beginning. Take volume away. So people from MIT, which I like very much, they did a measurement of the compressibility of uh, a condensate. But you have one density and one energy in each, in each position, right? So you have a, a lot of compressibilities. Does that make sense to you? A system that has many compressibilities? Yes, if the parts are independent. You all agree that the compressibility of the air here, and if I go 2,000 meters, will be different, right? Because I consider that the gas here has nothing to do with the gas there. But in a condensate, this is not true. And if that's not true, we don't like this. We like a gas to have a single compressibility or a single heat capacity. Because in this way, a gas will have one heat capacity in each point. A gas will have one thermal expansion in each point. So we came with a proposition. Oh, by the way. You may imagine why I'm so interested in defining a different way to look to this. Because I want to show that when a quantum gas undergo turbulent regime, some variation on compressibility appears. So I want to associate turbulence with macroscopic susceptibilities. And uh, imagine I do local density approximation here. You remember my sample? Has peaks and valleys everywhere? It would be impossible to do local. There's nothing local varying smoothly there. That would be a big mess. So that's why I'm trying to develop this, what we call global variable thermodynamics. And uh, basically, what I'm doing is redefining variables. OK? You all know that the grand potential that comes from the grand partition function. Uh, it is a product of an extensive and intensive variable like uh, volume and pressure. And uh, you, uh, maybe you, you, you recall that extensive variables are the ones that when I, multi when I scale the system, I multiply the number and the volume, the property. No, this is the, when I multiply the, the the constant, if it is extensive, I have to multiply the number by the same scale to keep everything constant. This is an extensive variable. An intensive variable is the one that I scale the in extensive variable and does not change. So if I have a gas, if I double the size of the box, doubling the number of particles, pressure doesn't change, temperature doesn't, no, nothing change, right? This is important property because uh, all the thermodynamic limit relies on this. All the thermodynamics is built up 
making things going to infinite, which is the thermodynamic limit. Remember? Probability is good when you have infinite things, right? Okay. So, uh, I was going to explain to you that the critical temperature for a trap, for a, a gas in a harmonic trap, scales with the number of particles this way. The appearance of the Bose condensation in temperature is related to the potential and the number of particles this way. So you can express that the critical temperature, which must be an intensive variable, scales like the number divided by this quantity here. In a homogeneous gas, it's the density, right? When you learn in school, Bose condensate, in the first course of statistical mechanics, you go there and see it's proportional to density. It doesn't matter the size of the thing. It's very bad when things depend on the size. We like things that does not depend on the size. So we call this volume parameter. You're going to say, oh, this has no dimension of volume. That's not the problem. You know, nobody asked me to have a volume that is centimeters cubic. I can have a volume which is a extensive variable. You understand me? Oh, if you don't like, you can multiply this by c cubic. And then this has dimension of uh, volume. But it doesn't make any sense, because this is, if I scale the number and I scale the size of the trap, <coughs> the critical temperature remains. And this is what we call thermodynamic limit for the Bose gas. OK? So we define this as a volume. And this makes sense, because you know, if I have a small frequency for the trap, it is very shallow. I have a very large volume in real space. So there is a big connection between them. But there is no uniformity here. It's very heterogeneous. Then if I have this as defined as volume parameter, of course, they obey the thermodynamic limit, which is a good thing. But then I can go back to who? The Gram partition function. <laughs> define uh, the system and calculate the Gram potential. If I calculate the Gram potential of a system, because in this quantum system, the best is to work in the Gram canonical. You remember this, right? Formalities. And then if I write this in terms of my parameters, I will find what is the pressure. Because there is one thing that the Gram potential demands. is the product of pressure and volume. So what I did is I define a volume parameter and I identify what is the pressure. And the pressure is this, oops, the pressure is this integral here. So this is for the harmonic trap, but can be used for any kind of potential that confines. And I can show that if it is a box, this comes back to the real pressure, the real volume, okay? Okay, so I have a pressure and I have a volume then, oh, they must obey this relation. If they don't obey this relation, this is the helmet free energy, then you're dead. They kill you. Theoreticians kill you if this is not true. So it must obey this and uh, obeys in this case because this is what they call conjugate variables. So P and V here, which we call pi and mu, are conjugate variables. So they define the state functions. Am I being too vague? I guess I am, but you know, we're going to have to survive. You know. OK, so what we did is go to the experiment and measure pressure and temperature. This is something like the state diagram, right? Phase diagram of a transition. So I start to increase the temperature. I have to keep number and everything because uh, life is like that. And uh, I see that uh, things is very, and this is, guess what? This is the critical point, is where the transition takes place. So having this diagram, oh, I can change the number, of course. I have different uh, equivalent to, I, if I keep the volume, I have equivalent to isodensities curves which they do for any phase transition. So I have a collection of curves like this. And then I can create the phase diagram, like the helium phase diagram, and separate normal and back. But this is not what I want. Oh, this is just to 
show you the helium, superfluid helium, and liquid helium, sorry, uh, superfluid li liquid helium, and uh, uh, vapor. So, and then there is another diagram here, another phase here. OK, if I have this, I want to measure the heat capacity. This is the lambda point of liquid helium. And if this is superfluid, it must have some reminiscent, right? Then we go there and measure. This is the definition of heat capacity for this system. Because what is volume? It's the potential kept constant. And then we go there and measure this. Oh, I'm not going to go in detail for all this. It's a wonderful thing. And this is the heat capacity for different numbers. OK. And from this, oh, there's something very interesting here. Do you know about gap theory? Gap theory is something they use in superconductors, superfluids. It's the energy you need to create an elementary excitation in the fluid. And they claim that when this goes to zero, the behavior of this near zero reveals the existence of gap for elementary excitation. This is very fundamental. If you, if you tell me, what are you going to solve in the world with this? I don't know yet. I don't know. But I can understand the system. Okay, I have no doubt that uh, super stuff will be used for something. Maybe computer in the future will be based in global thermodynamic uh, variables. Who knows? Anyway, this is the behavior. We measure many deviations, effects of interaction, heat capacity compared with theory, and uh, wonderful. And then uh, I'm going to do something very nice. Because I can go to zero temperature and zero number. And guess what? My pressure does not go to zero. Because pressure goes to zero only for classical fluids. For quantum fluids, if I go to zero temperature, pressure does not go to zero. So we did something like this. And what's very interesting is that I'm measuring pressure and volume. Oh, this I'm going to drop. OK, so this is what we measure. Each of these is one paper I'm putting here. Oh, maybe some many transparency is the same paper. So don't think I'm publishing like God. No, no. Some of them are. But anyway, one thing we did is come with the relation between the zero pressure, a single particle. How is the relation of pressure volume in the most possible lower energy of a quantum system? Guess what? It's exactly the uncertain principle. So my pressure times my volume is 1 30 of h bar omega. Interesting, right? Why is it interesting? Because Bohr, nobody doubts about Bohr, right? Bohr, Bohr. <laughs> Bohr is great. And Bohr was very worried about why quantum mechanics does not show up so clear in the thermodynamic variables. And uh, he wrote many, uh, this is older, huh? uh, 1930, Faraday lecture. He was worried about complementarity between thermodynamic variables. And there are many people since then trying to justify, to measure, but they never had a system that you can go and do thermodynamics of a, a single particle near the absolute zero. And this is Malau. So I think we are showing that uh, actually Bohr was right. And uh, we can verify this. But uh, as I told you, compressibility is something we want to measure. Again, compressibility is variation of pressure, of volume with pressure. So we start again with many volumes because now you have to generate variation of volume with pressure. So you have to get the isothermal diagrams. And this is what we do. You always start by measuring pressure as a function of temperature. And then we extract from there the isothermal transformations. From the isothermal transformation, we get the compressibility. Okay, And it's very nice, my compressibility. It's exactly like it should be. And people in helium still having a hard time to measure this during the phase transition. But this is not enough. 
we have to measure as a function of compressibility and everything. Oh, here I'm gonna, do, I don't know if there is any fan of local density approximation here because I am criticizing local density approximation, as you realize. But there are a million people that likes local density approximation. So imagine, I am having a hard time to publish because I'm showing to them that local density doesn't make sense because any tiny fluctuation locally seems that a peak that doesn't exist. It's just fluctuation. So we're having a hard time, but uh, no, many people I was elected to the National Academy of Science, and they asked me to speak about global thermodynamic variables. And I, I give a talk. Some people look like this. Some people are happy. And I hope uh, this will come in the near future, because it's very important. OK. Now, when I measure compressibility, I could go there and do something. But I measure also the thermal expansion coefficient near a Bose condensate. Those are properties that you learn in high school. But now we have to measure for a quantum microscopic system, which I think is legitimate, right? Everybody thinks it's legitimate. And uh, oh, what are my, sorry. Ah, so I have to go back later. You see, there is one thing in those quantum phase transitions, which is criticality and universality. All the thermodynamics properties that are important, scales which is this reduced temperature. Reduced temperature is the temperature minus the critical temperature divided by the critical temperature modulus. It's called reduced temperature. Is there anybody here that uh, works with uh, universality? No, right? You? Oh, you study, right? Stanley, remember Stanley from MIT that moves to Boston University? He's uh, one of the guys in universality. And Wilson got Nobel Prize by explaining ways of dealing with this, right? Renormalization and all that kind. OK, so all the thermodynamic properties seem to behave in the same way. And this exponent for classes of phenomena are the same. This is what they call class of universality. You may think, I, I, I do a lot of application, too. You don't think that I, I do basic science all the time. But if you try to do application without no basic science, you are just fooling yourself all the time, right? Because uh, important is Marconi. He invented the radio. You don't know who improved the radio from there. Or well, there are in the literature, but nobody cares. So you got to study fundamental things sometimes to be able to do applied science with basis, right? I don't think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a coincidence that the places in the world that do the best basic science are the ones that comes with the best technology. I don't think it's coincidence. It's what's happened. You know, technology is based on knowledge. So you know, what I want to give as a message, when we learn basic science, it's not a waste of time. Because the new breakthrough will be the guy that are able to take quantum optics or something, connect with some fundamental particle physics and say, oh, this is the new phenomenon. Because, you know, nature does not know. We build those theories, but nature is closed stuff. So that's why I'm studying universality. So those ex critical exponents is something that gave you Nobel prizes and everything. And we have a lot of experimental uh, exploration of this. No. There are two or three magnetic systems and something that, right? Uh, uh, Coutinho, uh, Mauricio. Mauricio Coutinho from Recife was one of the guys that shows that some uh, alloy and some magnetic materials, right, had a universal class uh, in the critical point. Well, there are many people co making good contributions on this. And uh, we're trying to measure those coefficients because they have a very well established relation between them. And this is what we're doing. We are measuring by looking to, this is the thermal coefficient, has a critical exponent. And we measure, and some people measure the, the other critical exponent. And we are trying to get if the, this is consistent with the theory in terms of the, the dimensionality of the system. Because some people are saying about fractal dimension for quantum transitions. All this magnetism and everything, maybe there are 
fractal dimension involved in those phase transitions. And well, this is what we want to see if it makes sense and things like this. Okay, now, oh, before thanks. <laughs> Another thing that's very important in those systems is sound speed. Sound speed for theoreticians is everything because it's the way to see how excitations will go. Even turbulence in, in, in fluids, sound speed is fundamental and in superfluid even more. This is the critical point. When you try to move things faster than that is when things break down. So measuring sound speed is important in those quantum systems. And we have a measure and uh, we have measured very well separating the using this thermodynamics. I'm going too fast, man. I think so. Sound speed, if you go to the books, I'll go to the book of Moisés Nussenswag. He has a very nice description about sound speed in classical fluids, of course. But you can understand a lot of things. So basically, the pressure variation with, with density is what determines the capacity of a system to vary pressure with density is what determines the sound speed. And you're going to say, well, who cares about sound speed? Yeah, you care. Otherwise, you, don't you don't cannot hear me. <laughs> sound speed is important. And then we measure sound speed as a function of temperature. Why we did that? Because there are a lot of theories. And we want to show if they're right or they're wrong. So we were able, with this thermodynamics, to really measure sound speed. And now I want people to go back and say, is that possible a system has so many different sound speeds? Because if I have a condensate and I use a local density approximation, my sound speed goes to zero to infinite because I go to zero density to big density. Well, that's a problem. OK. I'm doing something else in doing a thermodynamic when the gas is expanding. But uh, so why I give this talk? Because even the old thermodynamics we learn is a a nightmare to explain things. You know, we learned there. Kalin book, Kubo, what else? Other books? Huang. And uh, I learned in graduate school, undergraduate. I tried to apply my, my system, it doesn't work. So even in the very well established things, there are a lot to do, right? It seems that's infinite. And here we have a system that what do we learn? I took so many courses of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, and I cannot apply now. <laughs> I have to learn a new one. <laughs> it's very interesting, this science, right? But what, what's important is a, is a nice moment, right? I think besides the crisis of the world and violence and everything, science never was so demanding. We are facing so big challenges in humanity that any young smart boy knows that science is the place to be if he wants to be part of the solution of the big challenge. Doesn't matter what you take, science has to be there. And I hope uh, you guys in the school are motivated to be part of those solutions, right? Otherwise, it will be a big problem in the coming future. If we don't produce good minds, we're not gonna have good solutions. We are already going too much unbalanced. Don't see the TV tonight. <laughs> Don't spoil your day, right? <laughs> we are really facing a big change in, in society and humanity. Science was not so needed. So it doesn't matter what you do in science. I'm sure that my thermodynamic, maybe I could understand globally how things are going. And I don't know. But uh, we need scientists, good ones. Thank you very much. And. Uh, <laughs> Okay, this is a kit for teaching optics. And me together with a few guys that you may know, Brito Cruz, you know? Moisés, do Sensag. Mayana Zatz, Beatriz Barbui, Henrique Toma, Eduardo Colli, those are guys in different fields. Only me, Brito, and Moisés are the same physicists. We create a collection of kits for teaching science for young students. Why are we doing that? Because you see, everybody thinks that internet, 
substitute, the pleasure of discovering by hands. And it turns out that uh, people are not formulating new things, really, because uh, they believe so much in what is already established. And they don't experiment. We have to make people. You know, science is uh, essentially an experimental field. Theoreticians are very important, but they ask questions to their mind. Experiments are questions asked to the nature. When you do an experiment, you are asking a question to nature, right? And then you find the answer. Maybe you make a wrong interpretation. <laughs> but the answer is there. So it doesn't matter if you're going to be a theoretician or experimentalist. Learning science with experiments is essential. And it turns out that people are not doing that. Many schools are substituting experiments by simulation. And this is the, maybe the beginning of a collapse. So we decide, with the approval of the Academy of Science here in Brazil, to do a collection of kits. And we produce up to now 12. You can go to the site, and you see 12. In optics, we have uh, four. No, three. No, four. We have one with uh, geometric optics, another one that's color and sensation, another one that is uh, optical physics, interference or diffraction. We make the young kid to measure wavelength. It's great, right? Why believe that there is a wavelength there? I might be able to measure. If I'm not able to measure, this guy may be lying to me. No, not Sid, please. Sid doesn't lie. But my, my teacher may be lying. And so, and uh, waves. We made a kit that's a small water bath, and you produce waves, and you, study, you can understand the wave in nature. <laughs> and, I, and then we, that is mathematics. We have one on probability and combinatorial analysis. Oh, I applied this for young kids that did not know. We, we made 6,000 of those kids. And we try many schools for proof of principles and uh, with the support of CAPS, right? And we receive the answer back, and then we improve it. And uh, there is one in mathematics. There is two in mathematics now. One which is binary language. You all know binary language, right? Tell me, go to the blackboard and write the date of today in binary. You know how to do? Oh, OK, I got the wrong guy. OK, right. No, no. <laughs> okay, so. Do you know how to write your birth date in binary? No, normally, you know, maybe a special kid like this <laughs> will know. But regular persons, we all know that everything that we use today in technology does know about decimal. So binary, right? And we have no idea how that works. So we made a kit. And the kid learns how to write numbers, how to make calculations with binary. It's wonderful. I didn't know myself. <laughs> and another one in combinatorial analysis and probability. We gave this to kids on the eighth grade. They never learned probability. And then we apply, and then we make a quiz about a secret friend. You know secret friend? You take one name. and. And they all learn intuition about probability. It's very impressive. So even mathematics, you can learn by doing. OK. I would love to bring 12 and give you. But uh, I'm a poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> I brought one. In optics, it's very nice. You can go to the internet. There are demonstrations. I know that some of you do not understand Portuguese. But uh, Daniel Kleppner took the whole collection to MIT. They tried there in the summer school for high school students and was really a big success. Our kids are in Ecuador. I saw some kids from Ecuador yesterday. It is in Tunisia. There is no guy from Tunisia here. In the United States, and we hope this will be a success. Because this is not a toy. We all think that kids like to learn with toys. No, they like to play with computers now. They like a small real lab to play with. It's play, but it's not a toy. 
So we made very good quantitative uh, kits. And I'm going to, I know that you're so smart that I feel very bad to ask a question because I will not have enough kits to distribute. So we're going to make a lottery. <laughs> How are we going to do this lottery? You help me. <laughs> Everybody has a number here? No. I don't know anybody. Okay, so I, I, pull, I pull out the list for everybody, and you just point and we... Okay. Now, if you want a whole collection, today you can buy. There are two companies in Brazil selling. It's not expensive. And I, I, I encourage you to look to those things. You know, a guy that likes to learn, likes to teach, right? And uh, you may get a nephew. He wants to explain how is a lens, how a lens works. You can show how you make a telescope. You can show. It's all by projection. What's the recommended age of the kit for the kit? Depends on the kit. The biology is after 10. <laughs> because there's a microscope, a DNA extraction. The optics is after 12. The color, color and sensation. I, I, I gave this to some kids. They don't want to give back. <laughs> Because you learn how you see the objects. You learn how you can make colors that doesn't exist. You all know that uh, if I put red and green, you're going to observe yellow. But yellow is not there. So we explain to the kids the difference between colorimetry and spectroscopy. Things that many mature scientists do not know. <laughs> they get to learn in a very er early age, you know? Just make the roulette go. Okay. <laughs> Laís Fuji. <laughs> Laís, you Brazilian? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Laís, you have yours. But let's make uh, another lottery. <laughs> Tomorrow I will go to Sao Paulo. I drop another one here, okay? Let's make sure a foreigner will take in the bag. And you have to explain to the guy at the airport that this is not what it looks like. Roleta? Roleta? No, no, no. It's a roleta. It's a roleta. Lina. Lina, sim. Lina, you're from where? Uh, India. India. So I'm giving this for her, and tomorrow I bring one on colors and sensation. Very nice. We even explain how stereoscope image, which nowadays is in fashion, right? 3D movies, how that works. By the way, you know how the stereoscopic vision works? I guess you all know. I mean, this is your life, right? <laughs> okay, so forget about it.